and many of us today who are suffering in this life, I want you to keep in mind that there is nothing that you may go through that Jesus has had never gone through. He understands your pain. He understands your struggle. He was lonely. He understands your loneliness. We welcome you to day two of our global youth week of prayer where we have been and we will be sharing messages which are tailored under the umbrella of the theme, I will go. We need to take note, dear viewers, that the ultimate purpose of the church's existence is that of going ye therefore to making disciples found in the book of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. And our theme is a response to the mission that which Jesus gave us prior to his departure for heaven. I will go is a personal resort, personal answer to the big picture mission as to why the church is living. Our prayer as we will move through this week is that the Lord should compel each one of us to answer in the refrain of the theme, I will go. This evening, I want to invite us to the book of John, chapter 4, reading on verse 28 through 30. John chapter 4, reading on verse 28 through 30. The Bible has this to say, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who taught me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. The title of our sharing this evening says, Feel me. Lord, feel me. We are living in a world today which has proved it should be, to be so hard. When you look into our spheres of life, into different spectrums of life, you will discover that life has a nature of sucking our potential in almost everything that we are doing. Talk about our social, emotional life. We are dealing with a people that are emptied by life. Their emotions are boiling to an extent where we are almost dealing with human beings who are emotionless. Disappointments are everywhere and people are empty. Talk about our economic crisis and situation. Our pockets are empty. Our bank accounts are ravaging. To some extent, even though there was a proclamation in the, in the recent years that money will be so much money in our pockets, today we are talking about no money in our pockets. We are empty. Talk about our spiritual lives. We are empty. Our people no longer know uh, to distinguish between right and error. People are empty. Uh, in this presentation today, our prayer to God must be, Lord, fill me. We might have been emptied by life in all different spheres of our lives, but God has the capacity today to fill us to the whole. The book of John, chapter 20 today, presents to us a story of a woman who was emptied and finished by life, but 
the moment she had an encounter with Jesus, this Jesus filled her and he, and he empowered her. She was able to live up to the standards of her life. John, the writer of the gospel according to John, write, writes the gospel according to John. On his mind, he's addressing two threats or problems to the Christian church. Number one, on the mind of John, as he is putting down the gospel according to John, he tries to bring about the solutions to the cruel persecutions which the early church would go through sooner or later. As he, as he, spends, as he pens down the gospel according to John, child of God, we need to understand that John, as a writer, he has on his mind the issue of heresies, heresies that will ravage the young church as it goes by, especially the heresy of docetism. Sooner or later, as the church was growing, it was to pass through intense persecutions, especially from the Roman, from the Roman government. And this threat and this and this and these persecutions were to come simply because of their belief in Jesus. And in the gospel, according to John, as he writes this very gospel. John is trying to encourage the early Christians that regardless of what they go through, their labors in Jesus are not in vain. There is a reward that will be given at the end of the day to those who shall endure to the end. To handle the issue of docetism, the teaching that taught that Jesus never had a human body, uh, he just had he just had a form of a human body, a, a teaching which which further taught that Jesus could not die on the cross and his death was not salvific. Uh, we will see John writing to tell the people that Jesus is the ultimate Son of God, who was sent to come and save and seek that which was lost. We see in chapter four, child of God. John is bringing to us a scenario which is so important for our learning today. I want to make a little compare and contrast between chapter 3 and chapter 4 of the book of John. We see in chapter 4 that Jesus is encountering a woman. Whereas in chapter 3, Jesus is having an encounter with a man. The woman of chapter 4 is nameless, whereas the man of chapter 3 is mentioned. His name is Nicodemus. We see in chapter 4 that Jesus is having an encounter with the woman, and this was during daytime, but in chapter 3, Jesus is having an encounter with a man at night. In chapter 4, we see Jesus that he has an encounter with a woman who appears to be a nobody, but in chapter 3, he has an encounter with a man who appears to be somebody in the community. In chapter, in chapter 4, we see that Jesus is having an encounter with a woman who appears to come from an evil background, but in chapter 3, Jesus is having an encounter with a man who appears to be religious. I want to make mention to us today, child of God, that regardless of what you are in this life, regardless of where you come from in this life, we worship a God who is interested with each one of us regardless of what we are. The community may look down on you. People might despise you based on your class, based on your tribe, based on what you are, but you worship a God who is a universal equalizer. Both the young and the old, men and women, the nobodies and the somebodies, they find their level ground at the foot of the cross. 
In chapter 4, we see Jesus that it was about time when you're supposed to leave Judea and to Galilee. And the Bible tells us that he needed to pass through Samaria. We have to take note, child of God, that it was, it was something that was so much well known uh, between the Samaritans and the Jews that these people never had an intersection said. <clears throat> but we see Jesus, because he had a divine mission into Samaria, Jesus tells his disciples that we need to pass through Samaria. The word needed on chapter on verse 4 simply refers to the necessity, the importance, the vitality of Jesus passing through Samaria. It was a need, not a want. As Jesus is passing through Samaria, we should keep in mind that Samaria was the land which was regarded to be a land which was inhabited by the outcasts. It was a land which was known to be threatened by the enemies of God. Uh, Samaria, child of God, was known to be a land which was, which was inhabited by the non-Jews, by, by the people without any right of being heirs of the kingdom of God. Sinners and publicans and the uncircumcised Gentiles were people who were known to have been settling in Samaria. You should keep in mind, child of God, that the Samaritans and the Jews shared a bitter relations. Talk about their social lives. Talk about their spiritual lives. Talk about their economical lives. And also physical. We see that a lot of wars were raised between the Samaritans and the Jews. Socially, no, no intermarriages were acceptable between the Jews and the Samaritans. Spiritually, they were not to meet in any form of religious worship. Others were worshipping from the mountains mountains while others were worshiping from the temple there was no form of intercourse which was which was which was entertained economically there was no form of trade which was to be embarked between the two groups of people and we see that there was no physical meeting the wars were raised between the two groups but this is the place where Jesus Regardless of him being a Jew, this is the place where Jesus needs to go through. Listen to me, child of God. We see Jesus piercing through cultural boundaries and, and barriers. We see Jesus breaking the tribal and racial walls. He's moving from the Jewish parameters into the Samaritan circles. Real Christianity, child of God, calls each one of us to treat each other with equity and equality that we deserve. Is it not true today, child of God, that the people have divided themselves according to their own tribes and social classes in this life? Is it not true today, child of God, that even in the church of God, you can't, you can't work with a people who are not from your tribe, from, from your tribe? Is it not true? It's unfortunate that tribalism, racism, groupings, classes have infiltrated even in the church. But real Christianity the Christianity that was planted by Jesus require each one of us to treat one another as human beings. Listen, child of God, we may appear different, we may speak different languages, we may have different colors, and yet the blood flowing in our own veins is red, simply meaning that though we look different, we are one in Jesus. Listen, child of God, we must embrace unity in diversity. We can't look the same. We, we can't speak the same language, yes, 
but we are one in Jesus. He owned us both by creation and by redemption. Listen to me, child of God. Those of us who are tribal in this life, there is no heaven we shall go to because if we can't live together here on earth, how are you going to live together in heaven? And if you think that God is going to only judge us based on ten commandments, there is no tribal guy who enter the kingdom of God. Even if I was Jesus, I could have not risked. Jesus breaks these very boundaries. If you truly confess to be a child of God, you need to break the cultural boundaries and parameters and barriers. Pull through. That is real Christianity. Or else we are just but cheating ourselves. I've heard of parents who refuse their children from getting married to other people's tri- to other tribesmen except on tribe. Your daughter is growing older simply because people coming to propose her are not of your tribe. Look at that. Jesus pushes through. And by now, Jesus gets to Saika. And as he gets to Saika, he finds the well there, which was dug by Jacob, which he, which he gave to his son, Joseph. We are seeing the well, seated by the well. The well with fountains of water, which is everlasting, is seated by the well which, whose water comes but in season. The well that never dries, the well in Jesus, is seated on the well that needs rains to, to refuel its very waters. The well is seated by the well. The waters by Jacob's well, the well was deep. The waters were clean and fresh. The waters were sweet and free for all. We see, child of God, that the waters by Jacob's well perpetuated the lives of the people around that very community. Uh, the waters and the waters from Jacob's well, child of God, uh, this, these waters provided refuge and rest and help and refreshment to all the passerbys and the community members. The nature of Jacob's well, child of God, must characterize our lives as individuals. When people come through our lives, just like Jacob's well, they are supposed to find refuge, rest, peace, refreshment. But alas, it's a different story. The nature of Jacob's well must characterize our communities. But alas and hey ho, the communities around today is full of violent people, people that no longer look at other people as human beings. Worse is with the church. <clears throat> Instead of people finding refuge and peace in church, the church has turned to be poisonous to some members. Some people would rather be at home than come to church because the moment they come to church, they become a subject of discussion. Jacob's well was a nice place, refreshing and nice for all. Jesus gets by the well, and as he sits there, the cool breeze from Jacob's well affects him even so much he gets more tired and hungry and, and thirsty. Listen, child of God, this very nugget speaks to the humanity of Jesus. The fact that Jesus was 100% man and 100% God, it simply assures me that there is nothing I may go through that Jesus may not understand. <coughs> Jesus could get hungry Jesus could get tired. Jesus 
could get first. And many of us today who are suffering in this life, I want you to keep in mind that there is nothing that you may go through that Jesus has, had never gone through. He understands your pain. He understands your struggle. He was lonely. He understands your loneliness. 14.5 kilometers he had walked. And by Jacob's will, he's tired. Tells his disciples, go buy me food. I'm wondering why 12, why 12 men had to go and buy food for one man instead of vice versa. Judas, as the treasurer, was supposed to be sent to go and buy food. But we see in the passage that all of them went. Jesus is alone. We see Jesus, child of God, creating a lonely moment so that he can have an encounter with somebody. Moments of loneliness, moments of you being alone must not be a curse, but they are supposed to be a blessing to us. Moments of loneliness must be moments of transformation, but yet many of us, we use our lonely moments to do evil things. Jesus created for a moment when he was to be alone because he had a big picture mission to wake up. He's there seated by the well. As he gazes through in the sunny afternoon of that day, he sees a woman walking, coming to the well. As he looks intently into her eyes, he, he sees hopelessness. He sees helplessness. He sees guilty. He sees disappointment because the woman was already finished. She comes to the well in the afternoon and the idea is to avoid the company of other women. Why? Because she was known in the community as a husband snatcher. As she gets to the world, child of God, she gets there at a moment when no person is supposed to be found by the world. She avoided all human disappointment only to land into a divine appointment. She comes not expecting anyone. Yet somebody from eternity past had planned for this day to meeting her. In the eye of time, from the foundation of this world, God had planned of meeting this woman on such a day. Child of God, I want you to know that the God that we serve is a sovereign God. He's the time controller. He's a God who is not taken by, nothing can take him by surprise. He plans events and he ensures that he, the events get to fruition. He foresaw her struggle, her emptiness, her guilt, and he makes this appointment a possibility. She comes to the well and she begins to do her business as she used to be doing. She was used to the routine of daily coming to the well to fetch water for daily use. And this was the day as well. Without expecting to meet anybody, she comes as usual. Listen to me, child of God. It is possible to adhere to constant church attendance and spiritual obligations and yet without expecting to meet in Jesus. Some of us who have turned church worship services, church meetings to be something which is traditional. We don't miss Vespers. We don't miss Sunday and Sabbath worships. Yet without any plan of meeting Jesus. This was the story with the woman. She never expected to meet anyone because she was used. Child of God, the tradition of coming to church without expecting and planning to meeting Jesus, we will lead many of us to destruction. 
There are many of us who have been in the church, old men and women in the church, powerful leaders of the church, and yet without the relationship with Jesus. What will cost a man to own the whole world and lose his life? Plan to meeting Jesus. She begins to fetch water. And as she does, as if she did not see this man called Jesus, she begins to fetch water and her container by now was almost full. Jesus begins and initiates a story, a conversation. He says, give me a drink. Listen to me, child of God. Jesus is making a request as if it was for his good, but the request was for the good of the woman. Every request that God makes from us is not for his own good, but for ours. Returning tithes and offering is not for the good of God, but the good of us, so that God can have an access to our lives. There are some of us who think that working for God, we are doing him a good, we are doing him a service. Meanwhile, it is ours. Imagine if some of us were not serving as elders, not serving as pastors, not serving as youth leaders. Many of us by now could be dead in the, in the ruins of sin. The very request, the very service that we do for God might appear to be for his good and yet is for our benefit. He requests for water as if it was for the good of the woman. I mean, as if it was for the good of the man, for, for Jesus, yet it was for the good of the woman. So that he can have an, an access to our heart. She says, how can you, being a Jew, ask of water from me? She thinks that this is just like a common man who may pay adventure, take her for granted. I'm so glad, child of God, that regardless of how she thought this, woman, this man was, she was still able to identify that this was a Jew. I don't know about us. What do you have to say? What do you need to do for people to recognize that you are a child of God? Just by looking the woman could tell that this one is a Jew. Who are you? And how do people know who you are? Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and he who says to you, give me a drink, he could have given you to drink of the living water. Then the woman says, Are you sure? Are you greater than Jacob? The one who gave us the world. Listen to me, child of God. The woman is getting confused in a story because Jesus is deepening his discussion. He tells her, If you knew who is asking of water from you, you could have asked from him a living water and he would have given you, listen, whoever drinks of this water of this well shall thirst you, but whoever drinks of my water shall never thirst again. The woman gets even more and more confused. Listen to me, child of God. The woman says, Give me that water. In other words, Son of God, for the woman to be convinced to this level, Jesus brought the conversation to an extent where she, she was getting to believe in this Jesus. He tells her, if you drank off my water, you would never thirst again. Listen to me, child of God. The supplies of this world runs out. The beauty of this world, the love of this world runs out with time. But the supplies which are coming from a divine hand, they last forever. I have seen people who say, I do, in the presence of parents and church members and clergymen, I do in marriage. And yet after three months, the vows are omitted. 
Love from a man's heart runs dry. I love one song sung by Jesse Dixon with the title, Feel My Cup, Lord. Jesse Dixon says, Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I heard my Savior speaking, Draw from my well that never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsty of, soul, of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. She, she continues to say, there are millions in this world who are craving and looking for the pleasures, earthly things of God, but none can match the wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus. Christ, my Lord, fill my cup. I lift it up. Fill me till I want no more. Child of God, we see the woman telling Jesus that please give me that water. Just like this woman, child of God, it is high time we proved the supplies of this world to be supplies which come to an end. And we need by now to shift our attention from our own powers and supplies and the supplies of God. And Jesus told her, go call your husband. He now scratched where it was itching. She says, I don't have a husband. As if it was just to brush, to brush off Jesus. As if she just wanted Jesus to be quiet about it. I don't have any husband. Jesus said, yes, you have said the truth. You don't have any because by now you have five. And even the one in your room right now is not yours. The woman appears to suffer from the problem I call the problem below the belt. The pandemic the woman was suffering from was not COVID. It was the problem of the sin below the belt. And many of us are victims to this very sin below the belt. Powerful preachers, powerful singers, powerful leaders of the church, papas and bishops, and yet your belt is loose and weak. This was the problem of the woman. And she said, I don't have any. After Jesus explained all these things, she says, sir, you must be a prophet. You must be a prophet. Sir, you must be somebody, be someone beyond me. You must be somebody. Then Jesus told her, you should go and call your husband. She said, I don't have any. And finally, the Bible says, she decides to leave her water pot. And as she leaves the water pot, she's now embarking on a journey, getting to call the man. I want us to know, child of God, that you cannot be in the presence of God and remain the same. The woman leaves Jesus with a water pot. She is surrendering all. She is repenting. She is giving her all to Jesus. And she lives a changed woman. Listen, child of God, we see the woman from a prostitute. She changed into a prophetess. From being a sinner, she is now sent out as a saint. From being a zero, she goes out as a hero. From being a nobody, she goes out as a somebody. From being guilty, she goes out confident. From being empty, she goes out satisfied. From being shattered, she goes back restored. The moment you are in the presence of God, you will not be the same. She went out. To call the man. Listen, child of God. Listen, child of God. Many of us today are quiet about Jesus. 
Reason is because we have not yet had an encounter with him. The moment she had an encounter with Jesus, Jesus blessed her and this woman became a channel of blessing to others. From being a receiver of blessings, she became, she became, she became a blessing giver. She shared that which Jesus had done in her life. Listen, child of God. The moment we've had an encounter with Jesus, the moment this Jesus fills your heart, the moment this Jesus controls your DNA, you and I will be able to go and tell the world about what Jesus had told you, had done for you. Listen, child of God, every Christian is born as a missionary in the church. Whether you can preach or you can teach, regardless of what you can do, we are missionaries in, in whichever way we do things. You must be a missionary in your workplace. Missionary in the way you have, in the way you render services. Your attitude must be positive. She said, come and see the man. People came and they followed Jesus. This was done after Jesus had filled her. Our prayer today must be, Lord, fill me. When the Lord fills us, we will not remain the same. When the Lord fills us, we will not be silent. When the Lord fills us, we shall be indifferent. We shall stand for the kingdom of God. If it's a prayer today that God can fill you, that God can guide your life, that God can be the ultimate controller of your life, if that's your prayer, wherever you are, just close our eyes as we pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you so much for assuring each one of us that regardless of what we are and what we have done, you are still interested with our lives. Behold your daughter. Behold your son. Their prayer today is, Lord, fill me. Fill them up with your own supplies that will never run dry. And after you have filled us up, help us to be a channel of blessings to others. Thank you, Lord, for filling us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.